I invite you, Veritas Hunt, to speak to us on the theme of accommodation or transformation, LGBT inclusion in the Christian faith. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving up your evening. I'm sure that there are a number of uh, different things you could be doing in Oxford Town this evening, so I'm, I'm really chuffed that you've turned up. Um, I should confess that I haven't uh, been let out to do an hour-long talk for quite some time. I left Stonewall in, in 2019, and, and, and at that point I was very used to doing long, long different lectures on everything from cervical smear tests to uh, homophobic bullying in schools and parenting rights and same-sex marriage rights and international global rights. My knowledge is a bit ropey. Two years on, I'm a little bit retired. And in the House of Lords, you have four minutes to make your point, and if you can make it in three, that would be much appreciated. Mm -hmm. And in my day job um, as, as Director of Deeds and Words, and the word and is important there, um, Director of Deeds and Words, my, my talks tend to be on, on much broader subjects, but I've been tempted out of retirement by uh, the lovely David and his, his partner Michael, and I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have said yes to many people, but if you will indulge me, I will talk to you for about 45 minutes about my take on this issue of accommodation or uh, acceptance versus transformation. And I will get to God, I promise. There's a, there's a good section at the end on God, but I want to give a broader analysis of that before we get there, if, if you'll indulge me. I also never write speeches. I, I always talk. Um, I'm dyslexic, so, so writing down things has never been a big thing for me. I talk off the cuff, but something about this made me write it down. So I've got 20 pages of, uh, of a written speech that I kind of agonised over because I, I didn't want to let you down and I felt a bit rusty. And my partner, Karen, was like, can you never write speeches? I was like, ah, but look at my 2,000 words on... Uh... So I will read a bit from here, but as you can already tell, I will go off script uh, because... That is my want. And it's, it's recorded, but not live, so what, what can possibly go wrong? <laughs> um, I, I want to begin by thanking uh, Neil and, and Professor Bejean for, for a very generous introduction. It's been a real honour to be here, not least because I am quite by accident um, than designed the first to speak in this series. It's also, as has been acknowledged, LGBT plus history month, and what better way to discuss sexuality and gender than LGBT plus history month. In my time at Oxford, February marked the time when every uh, business in the land sent me plastic rainbow tat. Um, I'm really pleased, I no longer am a recipient of rainbow plastic tat, but uh, th there is a lot out there. You can get rulers, pencils, <laughs> little furry things that go on computers. It is a true indication of the transformation that this society has undergone over the last two decades, that you can get quite so many things in rainbow <laughs> colours, um, and, and something that we should all, all be very proud of, I think. Um, I've had the great privilege of knowing David and Michael for some time, and as the world seems increasingly struggling to grapple with how to consider these tricky issues, it's a testament to David's vision and generosity that he's created this platform, not only for research, but discussion as well. David and Michael have themselves played a transformative role in society and have been integral to the acceptance of LGBT people here and abroad. They're naturally modest, um, but this scholarship and speaker series is an intervention in a long list of transformative acts, and it would, it, it, that absolutely needs to be said. So I want to begin, if you'll indulge me, by giving some background information about me and my own personal pursuance of accommodation and sometimes a reluctant participant and sometimes driver of transformation. I was born in 1980 in Cardiff. My mum was one of five children who left school at 18 to train to be a nurse. By the time I was born, my mum was a midwife and went on to study around having me and my brother. She received a PGCE, an MSc, an MBA, and was awarded a PhD. She retired as Dean and Professor of Nursing and Midwifery from Cardiff University. My dad, born in Barry, learned to be an architect through apprenticeships and literally picked it up on the job. Both grew up in poverty, both became middle class, and let it never be suggested that they didn't. Uh, both wanted the very, very best for their children. So me and my brother worked hard. We had desks in our bedrooms from the age of three, books all around us, and we completed our homework before it was set. My parents were utterly determined that we would go to university and do the best we could. Oxford wasn't on my agenda. I was clever at school, and I know that's not the dumb thing to admit, but I was. And, uh, and, and, and I was going to go to university, but Oxford wasn't for the likes, the likes of me. It was my GCSE English teacher, Mr Hopwood, who in 1995 took my parents to one side and said they should be thinking about Oxbridge for me. 
And at this point, I'd also like to talk a little bit more about Mr. Hopwood. He was an amazing man. I think he was in his 60s and 70s when I met him. And in 1995, we studied a book called I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. And that was the only book by a non-white, non-British author on the Welsh curriculum of GCSE. So as an insight into black communities, it was quite limited, but, but he was doing his best. And there's a scene, and I, I hope this doesn't spoil it for you, in, in I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, where Maya, the key character, has sex with a man because she thinks she might be a lesbian. She's going through puberty and her body's changing and she thinks she might be a lesbian. Now, uh, in those days, Section 28 meant you couldn't ever talk about lesbians or sexuality or anything like that. And Mr. Hopwood took me to one side, peered over his glasses and said, you know, my dear, if anybody were to think they were a lesbian, they wouldn't need to have sex with a man. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Maya did have sex with a man, and she got pregnant, and, and that, was, that was my sex ed. Um, but it was truly innovative for this man, this old, elderly Welsh man. You don't have to have sex with a man, my dear. Um, anyway, so in 1995, I was also discovering that I really liked girls, and wasn't overly impressed with boys. I went to Cardiff Library, and I was, I now realise, so utterly blessed to be able to access a whole section of gay and lesbian books, as it was then called. They didn't amount to much. There was a lot of really dodgy lesbian fiction, detective fiction. So for, for the lesbians in the audience who, who might have known, there was a lot of really dodge lesbian detective fiction. Val McDermott wrote a lot of it, and, and I read it all. I read it all. I also read, there was another book called The Well of Loneliness, and for those of you who are new to lesbians, do not tip that as your first text. It's <laughs> pretty heavy going. And um, neither the lesbian detective fiction or the well of loneliness taught me to have sex. And that's kind of what I was looking for. And uh, there wasn't anything on that. But I also read the whole works of Jeanette Winterson. And Jeanette Winterson is, you know, if, if, the, if the bookshelves with the books on it was my accommodation, Jeanette Winterson was my transformation. And her work then absolutely transports me to another, another land. Um, I should confess that the prose of Winterson is quite particular. Uh, short sentences, heavy with promise and anticipation, and her style did influence my own approach to relationships. And most of my early uh, lesbian encounters did follow a rather kind of postmodern heaviness, um, <laughs> full of pregnant pauses and deep sighs. But it's, it's, you know, there, there are worse bases for lesbian identities, and there wasn't a lot going in 1995, so it could have been worse. So I was navigating my sexuality and, frankly, my intellect against a backdrop of hostility in 1995. Section 28, a piece of legislation that prevented the promotion of homosexuality in schools, was firmly embedded in British society. It was lawful to discriminate against gay people in the workplace. We couldn't serve in the military, we couldn't adopt children, we could be discriminated against when we tried to access hotels or NHS services. And against this backdrop, HIV ravished sections of our communities, a pandemic of catastrophic proportions that left swathes of our community broken, but also left to fend for themselves. My partner Caroline, 25 in 1995, was buddying, caring for gay men as they died, often being the only person at their funeral. The state didn't want to help those men. The homophobia was rife. Resources designed to help men have safer sex was condemned as extreme, dangerous, illegal, wrong, and gay male sexuality was conflated with paedophilia on a regular basis. The media was poised to be scandalised by every LGB act of inclusion. In my small Welsh world, I existed without hearing or seeing gay people. Beth Jordash kissed a girl on Brookside. Beth Jordash is Anna Friel. In 1995, Beth Jordash was the single most beautiful woman in the world ever, but she did kill her dad and bury him under a patio. So there wasn't, there wasn't an awful lot of uh, affirming stuff, and there was all this, all this negativity. Lesbians were considered to be um, dangerous. It was, it was, we were told we couldn't have children, that we, we couldn't, weren't fit to bring up children, that uh, when, when lesbians came out, their children were taken away from them. Bi people didn't get a look in either. It was a, it was a very dark time. And shame is one of the key outcomes of prejudice. We turn the hatred inwards and engage in a sometimes lifelong struggle to recognise our understanding and acceptance of ourselves versus the perceptions that others have of us. And that is a reality of growing up in a world that is, that is riddled with discrimination like that. 
1996, my family moved to Birmingham. I joined the sixth form of an all-girls grammar school. I was out from day one, and with a short haircut, baggy jeans, ten silk cut, and a rapidly improving ability to drink pints and still get my homework in, I launched. It was then that I realised that I was really different. There were lots of incidents that I suppose today would be described as homophobic bullying. But one moment that stood out for me, and I remember to this day, was a somewhat innocuous sounding comment from one of my fellow students. We don't mind that you sleep with girls, Ruth, but do you have to be so gay about it? <laughs> we don't mind that you sleep with girls. We don't mind. But do you have to be so gay about it? It's a turn of phrase that stayed with me from 1996 even to today. We don't mind, but could you just be a bit less you? And that, to me, is the difference between accommodation and transformation. And it's that that has always, with, coupled with that shame, hooked me back into different narratives about how far we go, how far we push, how much we ask for, how much we demand, how much we are accommodated, and how much do we transform. I went to Oxford. I remember coming for an interview and driving into Oxford for the first time. You may not have noticed, but if you drive in from Cardiff, you pass a McDonald's. The McDonald's is in what I now know to be a mock Tudor building. But at the time, I didn't know such things existed, so I just thought that even the McDonald's was really posh. <laughs> I thought there is no, I thought even, you know, I know about, we have McDonald's in Cardiff. Oh my God, it's in a timber clad building. Um, I was interviewed by the formidable Sally Mapstone, now the Vice Chancellor of St Andrews University. She asked me what I was reading, I said Virginia Woolf, she asked me why, I said I thought it would impress her, she laughed and suggested it would impress Cambridge more. I laughed. <laughs> I didn't get the joke, I'm not sure I get it now. But, but somehow on that shaky start, uh, Professor Mapstone saw something in me, something a little bit different. She offered me a very low offer, um, because I think she thought, this, this, kid, this kid will go somewhere, so let's, let's, give, her, let's give her a low offer. Um, it was an all-girls college then, St Hilda's. Some thought I'd chose it because I was a lesbian. I'd actually chose it because they didn't have sandstone buildings and had grass I could walk on. And one of the things I noticed about the House of Lords is it's built around a quad. And when you go to a school that's built around a quad, and you go to a university that's built around a quad, and then you do your um, legal training in a building that's built around a quad, the House of Lords feels very set comfortable. <laughs> and when you don't really understand a quad, you spend quite a lot of time walking around in circles. That's my, that's my top tip. But um, <laughs> sandstone buildings and grass I could walk on. And yes, I thought there would be some other lesbians at St Hilda's. That, that was a thing when I was 18, um, but I should have probably gone to Wadham. <laughs> that's <laughs> not right. Let's be honest. <laughs> I went on to be JCR president and president of Oxford University Students' Union. And also at that time, um, and I've just been reminded of this this evening, we had a documentary crew with us, because why not? So in 1998, Channel 4 moved in for three years and filmed six women at St Hilda's. And I was one of those women. And the co documentary was called College Girls, and it was screened at 9pm on a Sunday night in 2002. And it followed six women. It followed a girl called, woman, a woman called Lucy, who went on to be president of the union, and my God, did she have swishy hair and she was really glam. Um, there was a woman called Laura Pascal Brown, um, who was part of the socialist worker and was against tuition fees. There was Afshan, who was a medic and trained to be a doctor, and her Muslim family lived in a council flat in Newport. Uh, Tash, who was doing linguistics, first in her family to go to university, proper cockney, and there was me, the lesbian. And um, my mum said, whatever you do, don't tell anyone you're gay. Because if you change your mind, there's no going back, and you won't get a job. And it was a fear based on very real experiences of what society was saying. So I'm there, number three haircut, baggy jeans, 20 Marlboro lights by now, let's be honest. And I was like, well, I don't think I can not tell people I'm gay. Because I intend to do quite a lot of gay things, and this documentary crew. So for two and a half years, I didn't come out on camera. Now, I thought I was, I was pulling off some quite impressive deception, but I think the only person who's never read me as a lesbian is my GP, who still offers me contraception. But there was something, I was very scared about coming out on camera. I finally did in, in, the, last, in the last year, and that's film five, where I, I came out as a lesbian on film. The Telegraph at the time wrote up this beautiful six-part series, this 
monumental series of films about young women at Oxford, and film five shows Ruth Hunt, a young Welsh woman. This is 1999, 2000, coming out as a lesbian in the college gardens, and my mum reads this. And then they cancelled film five. So they dropped film five because Big Brother came out and everybody wanted to watch gay people make out on Big Brother, not a 19-year-old girl coming out in a college garden. So then The Telegraph wrote an article about how Ruth Hunt was hurt having come out as a lesbian. So more people found out I was a lesbian who was ever going to watch this little TV series <laughs> on a Sunday night. And uh, my mum felt, felt absolutely vindicated. But uh, I did it. So I went on to be president of Oxford University Students Union. Why Aozu and not the union? Well, the union required women at the time to wear dresses, and as I looked like Gandalf in a dress, and still do, I decided to go to the other place. I wanted to be accepted at Oxford. I wanted to belong and feel like I belong. I didn't want to transform it. I wanted to be accommodated. I was drawn to where I could be folded into what existed, where I could be me without blowing the bloody doors off. Did I want to fight for the right to wear a tux to the union? Not really. But I was the first openly lesbian candidate to serve as Aosu president in 2001. So perhaps I was a little more transformative than I like to pretend or think at the time. After a little meandering, I joined Stonewall in 2004 as a policy officer. I would work at Stonewall for 15 years, working on everything from education in schools to healthcare for lesbians, hate crime, access to higher education, resources for parents, legislation to allow lesbians to have babies, the right to adopt, the right to serve in the military, the right to access goods and services. I worked to produce the resources that my parents needed in 1993 and I got them in every library in the country. I worked with the most amazing people, young, mainly queer, hungry for change. We had government on our side. And that made a real difference. Ian McKellen, one of the founders of Stonewall, secured commitment from John Major for 10 key legislative asks. Tony Blair honoured and strengthened that commitment, introducing the groundbreaking Civil Partnership Act and the Gender Recognition Act in 2004. There was opposition to all of it. There is sometimes a sense that I just breeze through, yeah, yeah, no, easy. No, it was not. There was opposition to absolutely every element of it, of course. I remember registrars wanting the right to refuse to conduct civil partnerships and the government at the time refusing to give them that right. I remember those who provided services, such as B&Bs, wanting to retain the right to discriminate. The government refused. I remember adoption agencies wanting the right to exclude same-sex couples. The government refused. And as I list these things, it feels on reflection that we are in a period of extraordinary transformation. Those who opposed us were not accommodated. They were not given any ground. They were told, not, not happening. It was a period of transformation. But it was a period, I would argue, defined by assimilation. The goal was unequivocally accommodation rather than transformation. It became clear that we were advocating for the good gays, the gay people who were monogamous, who paid their taxes, who wore smart suits and worked in the city, who were polite and considered and diplomatic. And with that, I had to be a good lesbian. Even during my time at Stonewall, the visibility of lesbians remained and remains woefully inadequate. I was strongly advised to grow my hair, accessorise, get better clothes, be less angry. I think I was mainly sometimes a bit shy, but I was definitely read as angry. Be less lesbian. Do you have to be so gay about it? it was what was in my head, even in 2005, six, as I joined Stonewall. The sanitising of the gays felt an essential prerequisite if we were to be accommodated. And if you read the wonderful diaries of Derek Jarman, you'll see how strongly he and others rejected that assimilationist approach to our rights. In Smiling in Slow Motion, Jarman wrote in his September 1991 entry about Ian McKellen meeting with John Major. He said he would risk the hate that he knew he would come, but he would, and I quote, put the case against the airless stonewall. We cleared a few briars and they set up camp and announced they spoke for us. Why kowtow to the enemy? Why not demand what is right rather than beg? They are the enemy who attempt to put the clock back. As Peter Tatchell says, and I'm pleased he's given the next talk, he'll be, he'll be much more interesting than me, instinctively anti-establishment, Derek was a critical of mainstream gay lobby group Stonewall. He believed it was too tame, assimilationist, conformist. He didn't like its uncritical aspiration to mere equality within the status quo. Like many of us in outrage, he wanted to transform society for the benefit of everyone, queer and hetero. He had a healthy scepticism towards straight-serving laws and institutions, 
such as the police, church and armed forces, which in those days were still witch hunting us. He goes on to say he was irre irreverent, rebellious, questioning and barrier breaking, not at all cosy and comfortable. He never sought the establishment's embrace or approval. He loathed the power elite and what it stood for. I really wanted the establishment's embrace and approval. And I don't think I was alone in the movement in wanting that. And I think it's important two years out that I acknowledge that. That wanting to be accommodated felt very, very important. Felt really, and feels very important. I'm a baroness, I mean, let's not, let's not forget. <laughs> Being accommodated is very important. The question is, of course, is would the progress of gay rights, and I use that phrase quite deliberately, been as successful if an assimilationist approach had not been taken? I'm not sure. When I was CEO, we rebranded, all new CEOs rebrand, it's an absolutely meaningless thing to do, never do it, but we all do it. Um, and alongside our iconic slogan, some people are going to get over it, um, we adopted the slogan, acceptance without exception. I always found spagoi, as we call it internally, some people are going to get over it, um, too much, too abrasive, too demanding, and that exclamation mark, I didn't, it was too much. And uh, it, it, was, it was my predecessor, Ben Summerskill, who saw the impact that spagoi would have and the extent to which the slogan and the image became better known than the word, than the name Stonewall itself. Acceptance without exception felt right to me, but many felt disappointed with its muted request. It was too timid. Mm. We don't mind you speaking with girl Ruth, girls Ruth, but do you have to be so gay about it? Spagoi to me felt too gay. Acceptance without exception felt just about right. I don't know if we'd have achieved what we'd have achieved if we'd followed Jarman's approach. I do know that we'd have left fewer people behind. The assimilationist approach, arguably the good gay, the sanitised approach, meant we hid elements of our communities and denied others. I remember a colleague arguing that gay men would make better parents than single mothers, and on that basis we should be allowed to adopt. It made me ashamed then, and it makes me ashamed now. I remember an edict at Stonewall that said we shouldn't wear red ribbons for HIV Awareness Day in case we reminded the people we were trying to influence that gay men had sex, some of them contracted HIV, and some of them died. I think the campaign for acceptance became conflated with a campaign for the acceptable. And the cost, I believe, was high. Perhaps most obviously the cost was felt by trans communities. Internationally and historically, the LGB and the T have sat together. Trans people have always been part of the campaigns and have waited patiently while we pursued legislation and tackled prejudice against LGB people. When Stonewall undertook media monitoring, we called out the lack of lesbians on TV and how they always died every single time. We critiqued the stereotypes of gay men and noted the absence of bi people. We never mentioned the significant damage that the depiction of trans people had on the attitude to trans people. With the exception of Haley on Coronation Street, TV was and is full of often repeated tropes that depict trans people as deviant, the butt of jokes, dangerous and deceptive. And Stonewall simply didn't go there. And I think trans people are paying the price for that neglect now. When I became CEO, I started dressing as I wanted to. I invested in beautiful three-piece suits, ties from Liberty. I got my hair cut as I wanted. I threw away the pitiful collection of brooches that made up my accessories. I also made a concerted effort to bring in those we left behind. With different degrees of success, she said, slightly triggered, I opened Stonewall up to people of colour, trans people, disabled people. I tried to make our church broader. I thought Stonewall would remain unchanged during that process of broadening out. There's an often told story in diversity circles that concerns a table. Discrimination is when you don't invite people to sit at the table. Non-discrimination is when they're invited to sit at the table, they're your guests. Acceptance is when they are no longer guests but belong around the table and can contribute. You'll hear this described as putting another chair around the table. That's standard EDI chat. Every college with their EDI fellow will have that chat somewhere. It is at this moment, I think, that our affinity biases kick in, though. I want to sit around a table, but I also want to fit in. So we adapt our style, we change our message, we change our approach. We, we match the person who has invited us around that table in the first place and become a little bit less than who we were. Don't mind you sleeping with girls, do you have to be so gay? We just become a little bit less. Because we want the person who invited us to keep inviting us, because they like us. I think this was the basis of my attempts at change at Stonewall. I added a few more chairs, but it was still my Stonewall. 
You can take the analogy further. True inclusion, true acceptance is letting those who were once guests not only own the table, but redesign it as well, do things differently. This is really uncomfortable. Uh, you extend the invite because you're a good person, but now they're chopping up the Chippendale and you really don't like the font they're using. And you don't really like how they're presenting that argument and they, you wish they would just not quite say it that way. And <clears throat> that's when the transformation happens. And it's messy and disorganized and it can feel really, really risky. But accommodation will always keep us in the place where we say, you're welcome. Come and sit at my table and follow my rules. Transformation is when we lead to significant change. Was I an acceptable and accepted face of the gay rights movement or was I a transformative face? And, and note my past tense, that's, that's probably my, my, my issue. I was told that my clear lesbian identity, Dr Finn McKay, who you're hearing from in a few weeks and is marvellous by the way, would question my use of the word butch about myself. But it's clear that I'm very much perceived as a butch lesbian. I was told that as a result of how I was a lesbian, and we don't be so gay about it, I would struggle to make an impact in Parliament. The politicians would presume I was radical and an enemy of the power elite. It was a concern, but let's be honest, I'm one of the most establishment people in the modern gay rights movement. We'll get to God in a moment, but a practising Christian, assiduously non-party political, I was unlikely to face a closed door because of a short haircut. A recent write-up in the New Statesman by Gabby Hinsliff described me as the Ed Miliband of Stonewall. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take it, do you know what I mean? Um, it's a fair call. And those who said I'd struggle in Westminster, well, that's Baroness Hunt of Bethany Green to you. Um, so <laughs> that sort of brings my story first full circle. I'm Baroness Hunt now. But I still grapple with that tension between accommodation and transformation. I want to belong in the House of Lords. I want to be part of it. And I worry I'm too young, too gay, too much of a girl, not enough of a woman to be accepted. I want to be part of the gang. I feel like a teenager again. I'm 42 soon. I'm proper grown up. This is not the time for imposter syndrome, crisis of confidence, and worrying if they're going to be nice to me. And yet here I am. When I was invited to join the House of Lords, I took my usual studious approach to the task. I ordered books. One of those books is a rather large tome called Politics UK. This is the 10th edition. I was reading about the impact of Brexit on sovereignty and the difference between committee and report stage, and I came to the section on diversity. As I scanned down and read the numbers, 20 out peers in the House of Lords, this section jumped out at me, and this, this is a little bit indulgent, but I had to print it out and stick it above my head because I, it's just important to me. The Baroness Hunt of Bethnal Green was appointed to the Lords in 2019. I was like, shit. Hunt was the openly gay, spoke, outspoken chief executive of Stonewall. Upon her appointment, Hunt said she will continue to do everything in my power to achieve acceptance without exception for all LGBT people and advocate for equality for all communities, both here and internationally. This, it, it does go on, sorry. The peerage of Hunt can be seen as a major step forward in the symbolic representation of the LGBT community in British politics. Furthermore, her expertise on LGBTQ issues might enhance the substantive representation of the LGBT community in the House of Lords. On reflection, perhaps a little like becoming the president of Oxford University Students' Union in 2001, it's possible my acceptance to the House of Lords is somewhat transformative too. And in the words of uh, Stoneman, I do need to get over it. I was speaking with Jeanette Winston, <coughs> yeah, Jeanette Winston <laughs> about this speaker series, um, and, and I do still have a major adolescent power crush on her, and, and, I, and it, is, it is a struggle for me. Um, but I am able to have quite a pleasant lunch without completely fangirling. But um, with her usual lyricism, she, I was talking to her about you know, the accommodation, transformation, she said, Ruth, once you've kissed the frog, you've kissed the frog. And I went, yeah. <laughs> And I think what she meant is that, <laughs> is that whether the frog turns into a prince or not doesn't really matter. The decision you've made to kiss that frog is an act of transformation. Whether the prince appears. And as soon as we step into the space of saying, okay, gay people can adopt, okay, gay people can enter into a civil partnership, okay, we've kind of kissed the frog. That's, that's all I have to say about kissing frogs. Um, <laughs> Perhaps our decision to accommodate LGBT people, where we live, work, socialise, play and pray, is in and of itself an act of transformation. So, this takes me neatly to the consideration of the acceptance of LGBT people where we pray. 
It's not very cool, but I've always been Christian, even when my parents gave up on it. It helps that the Bible's a really good read, and the Welsh have the very best hymns. I mean, if you're going to believe in God, being Welsh does definitely help. When I'm asked about my faith, I'm always asked about reconciliation. Not repenting, not saying sorry, but how I reconcile two supposedly incompatible parts of my identity. And to be honest, it's through joy that I'm able to. Because that feeling overrides everything else. It dissolves the tension and is more compelling than any man-made assumptions about what Jesus expects of me. That is faith. At its purest, at its most compelling, faith is love and joy. It's easy to describe the absence of love and joy. It's harder to describe how it feels when it exists. It just is. It doesn't require explanation or definition. During my 20s, the majority of opposition to LGB rights was framed as religious objection. It's still the case now that those who oppose LGBT rights based on faith have been joined by some unexpected allies. Nevertheless, being gay was considered a problem for God. According to some faith leaders, being gay was an abomination, a sin to avoid. Celibacy was the best hope for those who refused to be cured of their affliction. We were a problem. We were not welcome. I'd been blessed in the first two decades of my life to have been spared the damage that so-called faith leaders and religious communities could inflict on my people. Now at Stonewall I was exposed to it every day. It took and takes a significant amount of courage to be a Christian despite the institution of Christianity. As a nation we have exported our particular brand of religious-based homophobia across the globe and we've got we're good at trade in the UK. We're really good at it. We've buried it deep into the fabric of societies and now look askance at those countries who maintain the view that homosexuality is a sin that sometimes warrants death, or the rape of lesbians, or the state-sanctioned hate crimes. We cannot look on from afar and tut around our dinner tables about what's going on elsewhere. It was our Christianity that made this permissible, and it is therefore, in part, our responsibility to try and fix it. I take that responsibility seriously. As a teenager, I remember asking my priest, um, although my, my priest was very good about the gay thing, I remember being 15 and saying, priest, I think I might be gay, and he went, I think it's really important you do your GCSEs, kid. As a teenager, I remember asking my priest that if we were so against abortion, why did the church not provide financial and practical aid and housing and support to anyone who found themselves pregnant? It wasn't a particularly sophisticated intervention, but although I could see why the church was against abortion, though it's important that I make it absolutely clear that I disagreed with them then and now, I didn't understand why they didn't do anything positive to help. Similarly, there are some people in the church who don't believe being, who, who don't believe being gay is part of God's plan, but the least they could do is lend a hand in stopping us getting killed. You don't have to believe everything about the acceptance of LGBT people to not be an idiot. I've spent over 20 years in small rooms having some of the most heated discussions about homosexuality and Christianity. One of the criticisms that was levied against me when I was CEO of Stonewall is that I avoided debate on difficult issues. I have literally been talking about Leviticus for 20 years. I am not in any way afraid to uh, confront difficult issues. My main aim has always been to achieve acceptance of LGBT people in the church. I want the young people who've gone to church all their lives to know they're still welcome as they realise they're LGBT. I want those handsome gay men to get married in a church someday, having those beautifully framed photos in front of the altar and their nanas beaming from the front pew. I want trans people to be part of the community and fellowship that comes with belonging to a congregation. I want us to be accepted. I want us to be accommodated. In 2019, I edited a book called Queer Prophets, published by HarperCollins. It was my attempt to get those stories out there, get people understanding the reality of being LGBT and interacting with faith communities. Why? Because I think that's God's plan and intention. And my faith says that it's God's plan and intention. I don't want to make anyone believe something they don't. I don't want to try and outdo someone on their interpretation of Leviticus. Although I should point out that the only grounds for divorce in the Bible is if you become a eunuch, choose to become a eunuch, or if a eunuch is thrust upon you, and therefore trans people have been allowed in the Bible and allowed to divorce for quite some time. Side note. Um, I just want the love that is supposedly the basis of Christian faith to be extended to LGBT people. Love thy neighbour. The Church of England is very good at discussing things at length and disagreeing with each other at length. 
It's literally a broad church where those who detest the idea of the women vicars can continue to detest the idea whilst another parish makes a woman a bishop. One rector can refuse to marry someone who's been married before, another can open the doors wide. On this, though, they are strangely reluctant to disagree. Those who are called to ministry are told that they must declare that they agree with the church's position on homosexuality. A poorly worded policy statement. It hasn't even got, like, stamps on it or anything. Those ministers in same-sex relationships must make a vow of celibacy. They can think gay thoughts, but they mustn't do anything gay. And uh, although they can enter a civil partnership, they can't get married. But things are changing. There is an emergence of accommodation. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, is, I believe, an extraordinarily good man. And there are many like him across the Christian church. In March last year, he commented on remarks made by the primate of Nigeria. And it's worth hearing because I think it's significant. He said, the Archbishop, Metropolitan and Primate of all Nigeria, the most reverend Henry C. Ndukaba, issued a statement on Friday the 26th of February, which re referred to the deadly virus of homosexuality. The statement goes on to use phrases like, homosexuality is likened to a yeast that should be urgently and radically expunged and excised, lest it affects the whole dome. It also states that secular governments are adapting adopting aggressive campaign for global homosexual culture. And then he writes sick to reassure us that it's not his grammar. I completely disagree with and condemn this language, says Justin. It's unacceptable. It dehumanises those human beings of whom the statement speaks. I've written privately to his grace, the Archbishop, to make clear that this language is incompatible with the agreed teaching of the Anglican Communion. This resolution both restated a traditional view of Christian marriage, so don't worry, no gays are going to get married, but it's clear in its condemnation of homophobic actions or words. It affirmed that all baptised, believing and faithful persons, regardless of sexual orientation, are full members of the body of Christ. Now, that might feel very boring if you're not a God person, right? Like, if, if God's not your thing, like, um, whatever. Archbishop of Canterbury, to make it absolutely clear in those unequivocal terms on an international platform, that LGBT people should be accommodated is revolutionary. The Anglican Communion, he says, continues to seek to walk together amidst much difference and through many struggles. I urge all Christians to join me in continuing prayer for the people and churches of Nigeria. What the Archbishop of Canterbury is affirming in this statement is there is space for the accommodation of LGBT people and there is no space for hate. Of course, the approach of the Archbishop and my approach is to strive for acceptance, for accommodation. I shy away from the idea, in the same way I did at Stonewall, that LGBT people might transform the Church of England in particular. I want to be polite, accommodating, and accommodated. I don't want to be too gay about it. I want to find peace and reconciliation with even those who think I am most definitely going to hell, and that's just for the tie. I'm part of this community, whether I, they like it or not. Like Auzu, or the Lords, though, my membership of the club is transformative, however coy I want to be about it. For those unfamiliar with the Lord's Prayer, the one that starts, Our Father, who art in heaven, there's a line that always causes me more trouble than any others. We ask God to forgive us our trespasses. That's easy. God forgive us. Great. But then we say, as we forgive those who trespass against us. That's a much, much harder proposition. We have to forgive those who cause us harm, and that, my friends, is the unequivocally transformative act for the person being forgiven and the person who is doing the forgiving. I forgive those who hate me because I'm gay. I understand where their views have come from, their origin stories, and the narratives that keep those views entrenched. When I forgive, I can let go of my anger and actually see the person standing in front of me. There are others who think my approach now in relation to God and during my time at Stone was too accommodating, too forgiving. I should have been pushing for transformation rather than acceptance and accommodation. We should have been demanding that the church accepts LGBT people. Better yet, we should be stripping the church of its power, dismantling its property portfolio, taking away the bishops from the House of Lords, though they are the single most radical wing of the House of Lords ever. <laughs> Naming loudly the insidious impact that faith communities have had on women, LGBT people, young and old people. We should be demanding whole-scale revolution. But I don't want that. I want the Christian church to be part of the fabric of society. I think it's a good thing. And I want LGBT people to be part of that fabric too. 
Such reconciliation is messy and uncertain <clears throat> for me and others. Forgiveness is hard. Twitter and even mainstream media won't allow for that nuance. The uncertainty, false starts, misunderstandings, understanding collaboration rather than conflict and disdain. The key difference in 2022 compared to 2012 or even 2002 is I think that those who call for change or suggest change or try and negotiate change are considered radical, extreme, angry and fixed. We become caricatures of ourselves, regardless of what side we are on. As I find my different voice in this new stage of my life, where long speeches aren't my daily routine anymore, I'm able to acknowledge that we have to strive for acceptance if we are to transform. And acceptance requires shifts on all parts. We have to be prepared to kiss the frog. It also means we have to forgive each other as we make mistakes and find our way. And it means sometimes letting someone else design the table, even if it's not the table we wanted. As Leonard Cohen says, forget your perfect offer. Forget your perfect offering, there's a crack in everything, it's how the light gets in. And as Julian of Norwich says, and I have a large uh, tattoo in the original Middle English on my back, incidentally, um, <laughs> sin is necessary, mess is necessary, uncertainty is necessary. Uncertainty isn't going anywhere, and we cannot deny the collective and individual grief we're experiencing during the global pandemic. I'm beginning to believe that the grief and uncertainty might give us the opportunity we need to connect with our convictions and each other in a different and more profound way. It might open us up to others in new and unexpected ways. Our aspirations to exist in a world that is safe and certain is not possible. We're meant to be lost at times. And I think that's where the power for transformation lies, through our relationships with others. So let us continue to navigate disagreements, complexities, mess and each other. Use social media less, Talk more, worry less that you might be too gay, and if you're given a seat at the table, work out how to improve the table for everyone. The acts of accommodation will become acts of transformation. Thank you very much.